Hello, and welcome to How to Achieve Comprehensive Protection for Your Applications and Workloads. Today's webinar is sponsored by Palo Alto Networks and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Scott Becker. I'm from Actual Tech Media, and I'm excited to be your moderator for this special event. Now, before we get to today's great content, we do have a few housekeeping items that will help you get the most out of this session. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in our webinar control panel. Not only will we have team members responding to questions during the live event, we'll also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentation where we'll discuss in greater detail some of the top questions that you ask. That Q&A panel is also the place to let us know about any technical issues that you might be experiencing. A browser refresh will fix most audio, video, or slide advancement issues, but if that doesn't work, just let us know in the Q&A and we'll provide further technical assistance. Now, in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find that we're offering several resources. There's a Gartner Market Guide for Cloud Workload Protection Platforms. There's a paper on Container Security 101 and details about Prisma Cloud, which you'll hear more about today. You can also find links to the Actual Tech Media Guerrilla Guide Book Club and the ATM Event Center, which has our calendar of upcoming events. So I encourage you to access those resources now and share them with your friends and colleagues. At the end of this webinar, we will be awarding a $300 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. Of course, you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. The official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can be found in the handout section. Just scroll to the bottom and you'll find the prize terms and conditions link there. Finally, one of the best benefits of this event is the opportunity to ask a question of our expert presenters. So to help encourage your questions, we have a special additional prize for you. That's another Amazon gift card, this one for $50 for the best question. At the end of the event, we'll look at all the questions, pick out the very best one, and contact that prize winner. And with that, let's get to today's fantastic content. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. We have Ivan Melia, who's Senior Manager of Product Marketing at Prisma Cloud at Palo Alto, and Mohit Basin, who's Senior Product Marketing Manager for Palo Alto Networks as well. Now, before I bring Yvonne and Mohit on, I've got a quick poll for everyone. This is the first of several today, so keep your mouse clicking hand ready. This poll is how many vendors are you using to protect your workloads and applications? Um, and uh, so you can see the responses starting to come in. Really appreciate that. Please, uh, please keep them coming. Uh, and while everyone is responding, I'm going to bring on our guests today. So even and, and Mohit, welcome. Thanks, Scott. Great to be here. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Scott. Enjoy. Yeah, Thanks great to have you here. Really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to uh, to all you guys have to talk about today. This is a this is a great great topic, um, and it looks like we've we've got plenty of answers here on this one. So we appreciate everybody answering that. So I'm just going to go ahead and turn things over to you, Yvonne. Take it away. Yeah. Thanks so much, Scott. And yeah, thanks for responding to that first poll. Um, that third question, the uh, third answer should have really been um, a four plus, but, but I think everyone figured that out. Thanks so much for responding. This gives us some good insights to get a sense of the market right now. Yeah, so again, welcome to, uh, to our presentation. So what Mohit and I prepared uh, as a presentation and uh, a product demonstration at the end, kind of sub 20 minutes for each of these, both two sections. And then within the presentation, we're going to start with a, some of the market requirements um, and uh, or market trends and uh, and requirements, uh, just to level set, just a few minutes introduction. Then we're going to jump into showing a continuum of, of security from network level protection, and then going into into our applications and workloads uh, that reside in the cloud. Um, and then Mohit will talk um, more about our web application and API security module. So to kick things off, I would like to, as I said, briefly level set, cover some of the notions on cloud native evolution, some of the market requirements, and really the drivers when we specifically talk about 
um, prevention, protection. So we talk about agentless scanning, agent-based security, and so on. I think this is all going to be in the context of, of application security at the workload and the runtime level. So I think the, the best thing to explain this first part here is in order to understand the value and opportunity in the cloud um, and the complexity of security that, that we have today, we need to understand how organizations have gravitated towards multi-cloud and hybrid cloud environments. And there were two waves. In the per first wave, organizations moved uh, through what was called the lift and shift architectures. In many instances, we're taking a uh, a monolith application, our legacy application, and you're focusing on leveraging virtualization, running in the public cloud to deploy these applications, effectively reduce our on-premise data center footprint. And we get operability as an instant uh, a benefit right there. Um, and this has been a major effort in the last uh, few years. What we're seeing right now and on the right-hand side is the adoption of cloud native. We leverage cloud native technologies such as microservices, architectures, containers, uh, Kubernetes orchestration, platform as a service, and, and, and also proliferation of serverless function as well. These technologies effectively allow our applications to be spun up and down on demand. Uh, they also allow modern GitOps, DevOps-driven workflows where applications are deployed using automation. And this is really the end goal. Um, and in many instances, we're um, releasing on a daily, weekly basis. Uh, no matter how cloud is used, you and your teams are managing um, anything that powers your, your application. So we talk about a shared responsibility model between you and your cloud service provider. We, we look at the three different levels. Well, the cloud service provider is responsible for the physical security. So effectively securing the building where the cloud infrastructure resides. Uh, second thing is about security of the infrastructure that powers the cloud. So at the low level, we're talking about compute storage network uh, and then database virtualization and other components of a federated cloud. All of this up until this point is the responsibility of cloud service provider. And the last part is about running applications and application security, which is the responsibility of the user. So this would include everything from securing your code, permissions, configs, your workload and runtime um, environment security. And some of the things uh, to think about from a security standpoint are, are my networks reliable and secure? Uh, am I efficiently distributing my workloads across my infrastructure? Are these workloads protected? What about my data? What about my... Uh, my access management and so on. So bottom line, it's not only about the migration of apps and data, but the proliferation in these heterogeneous architectures coupled with the multi-cloud and then the usage of different technology stacks to build, deploy, and run applications. Ultimately, this drives the complexity of security. And my last slide for the introduction is really how workloads have changed and what they have become, I would describe with these four characteristics. Um, and I read one interesting uh, um, um, analyst research here. They talked about location, size, duration, and architecture. So the way I rationalize this, when we talk about location, it's about portability of workloads. They can be on and off cloud. They can be in a data center or in the air-gapped environments. About size, it's about granularity of workloads. So I don't have anymore my legacy app. I don't have the monolith. I had got the technology and products around microservices that effectively enabled me to break my um, applications, the more manageable components, it's easier for me to manage it during the, during the uh, entire life cycle. Um, from a duration perspective, workloads are ephemeral, and that's a good thing. Some need scaling up, down, some need scaling out, and some are updated, as we said, released on a daily basis. And then from an architecture perspective, it's really about what we mentioned, microservices, containerization, proliferated use of serverless functions, and how workloads are deployed across heterogeneous environments. Why this is all important for us? Well, this evolution of workloads effectively, when we look in the context of four stages in the modern application lifecycle, code, build, deploy, and run, the attack surface increased. There are many attack vectors along the application's lifecycle, especially in the run stage, which we'll talk more about today. And here on this slide, we got some examples about some breaches. And we see a breach in an incident in the news. It's almost always a breach in production. And bottom line here is traditional security controls don't fit multi-cloud environments. There's an overall lack of visibility into vulnerabilities across the application lifecycle, such as cloud misconfigurations, vulnerable software components of our apps, and attackers can use, exploit, and enter the system. 
containers, microservices-based apps, serverless functions, they require um, <clears throat> different architectural approach for enforcing application security. And legacy systems can provide actionable insights into these heterogeneous environments. What I'd like to show next is drive through a, a little um, uh, animation here. When we look at that, um, a continuum of, of uh, protection when we go from network into the cloud. And this is important uh, in the context of web application and API security. And, and Mohit is going to cover a demo about this. So between our application and the internet, there's always a routing element by design. It could be a router, it could be a firewall, something that provides L2, L3 protections, such as IP port uh, filtering. Uh, intrusion prevention, and so on. Everything else appears as legitimate traffic. So you can think of it as HTTP, HTTPS. And we have 800% uh, increase in, in web-based attacks over the last two years that effectively bypassed this, uh, this level here. Um, it's a known fact that web attacks are, as I mentioned, most common type of external facing uh, applications. And there was another research that said that 32 of global security decision makers whose services experienced an external breach said that the attack exploited a web app. Uh, applications are now API driven. That leads to significantly larger attack surfaces. And, um, and the truth of the matter is that web-based attacks and API vulnerabilities are just one piece of the puzzle when it comes to securing all your cloud native applications. Uh, isolated point solutions lack broader context into misconfigs, vulnerabilities, and app attacks. They could also create an unwanted noise. So I would like to just mention um, a cross-site scripting um, uh, as an example. It's a web security vulnerability allows an attacker to compromise the interaction that a regular user would have with an application. It allows an attacker to circumvent origin policy, which is designed to segregate between different websites. And the way the attack would work is manipulating a vulnerable uh, website so that it returns a malicious JavaScript code to users. This involves an attacker uploading um, a piece of malicious script code onto the web app. And when the malicious code is execute, executes inside the victim's browser, the, attack can, uh, the attacker can fully compromise the interaction with the application because as a result, the attacker can steal the user's active session cookie and uh, steal data, perform other kinds of app, kinds of application abuse. And this strategy is relatively unsophisticated, but still remains a, a, a quite common as it can do a significant damage. So we're really looking at those high severity, low complexity type of things. And this is the reason why we're introducing uh, web application firewalls, also known as web application. So web application firewalls are known as WAFs. They operate at the application layer and they are highly effective gatekeepers when it comes to filtering, monitoring, blocking HTTP, HTTPS traffic to and from a web service. Um, as we said, majority of web apps today are built using cloud native architectures. The ideal approach to securing against the web-based attack changed. Organizations must now incorporate web app and API security into the cloud security strategy um, and having a solution across the full application lifecycle includes securing the workload, whether it's, if it's a, a virtual machine, a container, serverless function, as well as protecting web app and APIs that run on these workloads. Um, WAFs, I think, effectively, they disaggregated um, because these capabilities that are part of the traditional WAFs, are, are, they need to be closer to where the application is. And because we have microservices, we have to really be at the workload level. And that's why the web app and API security um, is something that runs uh, as close to the application as it gets. So microservices uh, application deployment models, they require this application-aware security. Uh, in addition of having a full-fledged WAF, which you have with the WAS, against OS top 10 type of attacks. It also adds the API security, which is one of the major problems today. Mohit's gonna talk more about this uh, in terms of API abuse, bot protection, denial of service, and so on. So I think this is a very powerful configuration for both network level and uh, application level protection. And again, in certain scenarios, everything above this level will again appear as, as legitimate traffic. And, and this is really what we're looking to analyze here. So let's see what those scenarios would entail here. We're going to uh, zoom into our server that runs our application and look at the different risks across the application lifecycle. So namely code, um, a build, deploy, and run stages. And I'll walk through uh, a different risks and countermeasure techniques um, in, in a moment now. And so here we have a, an example of what those uh, a different 
attack vectors could be along these four stages. So everything from, if we talk about shift left, uh, we really want to go as far upstream as possible um, and manage our code. Um, so you're looking at ideally a solution that can um, integrate with your um, IDE environment where you write your code in case if you're a developer. Um, also, also if you're a DevOps, uh, something that integrates with your CI CD workflow so that you can manage both repositories and the security of code. And so here an example would be an infrastructure as code. It could be different types of uh, code above scripting that we need to secure. From a build perspective, we're looking at vulnerability and compliance uh, for things such as uh, images and registries that we use to um, deploy our applications in. Um, also image analysis sandbox. This is a very powerful um, um, capability that you would need. Sometimes images, and we often um, pull images from third-party resources, they may have a benign uh, piece of code. Uh, and once, once um, that image hits production, um, that code may download a malware. And the only reason, the only way to effectively realize what's happening is if you have an image analysis sandbox that can run that image and simulate the environment, simulate the runtime environment and discover effectively what's happening uh, at the network level and then at the runtime level. Uh, I think we have a poll next. Yeah. So as I introduced briefly, code build deploy risk. Uh, cold, cold code build, deploy, and run risk. Um, if you could please um, answer uh, this simple question, which of the three stages do you care about securing the most? Okay, run is pretty high, which is good. We're talking mostly about that today, but it's very interesting that um, we're seeing folks requiring uh, shift left capabilities, which is great. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, one third each. It's a tie. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for responding to this one. So I, what I'm taking Mohit here is that everything is important, which is a good answer. <laughs> yeah, everything across the application life cycle. Yeah, no, no blind spots. I get it. Okay, so let's dig a little bit uh, deeper into the runtime risk with containers. Uh, some examples will be broader, have broader applicability. Picking up containers is one of the most popular ways to deploy apps. Um, so I think uh, the way I see it, the best way to look at the situation is through the lens of the operating system. So everything from network uh, access, uh, the host, the host that can effectively, you know, you have your, your agent for your, you know, Kubernetes scheduler, uh, you can have your pods, your tens and hundreds of containers there. Uh, you'll have configurations and then runtime in your application software. Um, so web applications are the face of the application that's that's running. Um, just to tie back to the story of, uh, of WAFs and WAS that we just discussed until now, attackers would use that as an entry point into the application. And we'll talk more about this in, in one of the examples during the demo today. So they will use that to exploit a vulnerability uh, in code, gain access to data, and effectively exploit an application, worst case scenario, they enter in the system. They would find a vulnerability and exploit it to, to bypass effectively any, any uh, uh, bypassing any controls if, if we have in place. Uh, this is enabled by a few shortcomings now that are part of our, our application. So it could be an open port, uh, an unsecured credentials, permissions. It could be a vulnerable code, some, some type of a zero day. Uh, uh, exploit uh, a package or, or a dependency. And then here on the, on the right-hand side, I have a list of uh, different attack vectors. So once in the system, the attacker would perform different reconnaissance techniques to find other exploits and what other nefarious things could be done. Uh, this includes similar techniques that are used in penetration testing, ethical hacking. Um, so it's, it's about operating system fingerprinting, file permission analysis. Can we run a network service here or no? 
Um, and I will talk a few more minutes now, uh, just cherry pick some of the risks and runtime uh, and talk about what they are and then what kind of tools, processes, best practices we can put in place. So the first one I will start with is vulnerabilities within the runtime application. So the runtime software vulnerabilities are relatively uncommon, but they're particularly dangerous in scenarios where a malicious software can attack resources in other containers of the host OS, effectively allowing an attacker to access another container or monitor the inter-container communication. So from a countermeasure perspective, a vulnerable container exposes all containers it supports and the host itself to risk. So it must be carefully monitored for vulnerabilities. Uh, and when problems are detected, they must be remediated quickly. Uh, there are certain tools to monitor for common vulnerabilities and exposures, CVEs. So NIST, for example, would manage a database that will, um, uh, but, but this is at the public level. At the public level, the, everyone has access to a NIST database for CVEs. There are also tools that will have an online database that is hooked up to a system uh, and as soon as the CV pops up and it's known, it, you will get a notification saying that there is something on your host because otherwise it will be nearly impossible to know um, about every possible um, um, software bug that could lead to an exploit or a zero day issue without something that brings more automation. Um, and this is a better way to, to manage your instances at risk if we have some sort of a, uh, a monitoring uh, capability for our CVs. And the next one I'd like to talk about is the application vulnerabilities. So this is not so much about containers, but the application that runs in it. So if we considered a, a web application subject to cross-site scripting, as I mentioned before, or a database to subject to a SQL injection, this will be considered a compromised container and could be misused in a way that grants unauthorized access to sensitive information. The existing host-based intrusion detection processes and tools are often unable to detect and prevent these attacks within containers due to different technical architecture and, and some of the operational practices. So when we think about what to implement, the additional tools that are more application and container aware, uh, they're designed to operate at scale and, and the change rate that we typically see with containers we need to automatically profile containerized applications by using um, behavioral learning techniques to build security profiles for them to minimize any human interaction. Uh, so here, what I'm talking about effectively is, is yes, some level of automation. But when we talk about profiling, uh, we really mean about what, what this container or this process should do. What is a, a known and expected behavior of, uh, of my application, my, my container, my workload, depends on the level you look at. Um, how many process executions are happening? How many system calls does this container issue? Uh, does it need to peek and poke in memory? Is it configuring some files? What about file system access? Um, um, any, any, anything at the TCP IP level, any network listener there? So if we look at um, um, across this list, the question that I really ask myself is why a random container should spawn a process that suddenly issues system calls, they do something in my file system, maybe pick and poke in my memory, create a, a new process that is a network listener or, or send some, some packets um, left and right. This is all an anomalous behavior. Once we build the application um, 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 model based on this, this expected and known behavior, then we can compare the two that model against the runtime activity and, and effectively say, hey, this is, a, this is an anomaly and raise a flag. Um, another thing we should do is containers should be run uh, with the root file system in, in read-only mode. So they can isolate any writes to specific directories, which can there be uh, more easily monitored by the tools that we have in place. So this would make containers more resilient to compromise since any tampering is isolated to that specific location and could be easily separated from the rest of the application. Um, another thing I would bring up here is the uh, large attack surface. Um, this is an easy one. It's about optimizing your attack surface. So minimizing the channels that open up for potential attacks, such as any network uh, accessible service providing a potential entry point for attackers. Um, so if you're using a container-specific OS, that's great. Threats are typically more minimal to start with since the operating systems are specifically designed to host containers and have other services and functionality disabled. 
If you think about Linux, Linux group is based on technology that it's quite old. And when it was designed, cloud was not around. So it wasn't really perfect for cloud. So that's why we have other container uh, operating systems that are more container aware, container specific, and as I said, have some certain functionalities disabled, just simple to, to um, help with um, um, securing the, uh, the infrastructure. Um, these optimized OSs are designed for hosting containers, typically, um, as I said, read-only file systems or some other hardening practices by default. So this is definitely something that, that we should look into um, as a best practice. So a recommendation here is to use the minimalistic OS to reduce the attack surface and, and potentially not a full-fledged um, uh, Linux distribution unless it's really required. So this way you would mitigate some of the typical risks um, and, and have hardening activities that are associated with uh, maybe general uh, purpose OSs uh, if, if you would need that. And lastly, hosts should be continuously scanned for vulnerabilities and updates should be applied quickly. So instead of SSHing into each and every machine, there's ought to be some sort of automation that would say, hey, you are having uh, a disk dependency for your application. Um, there's a zero day vulnerability, a CV popped up, um, the vendor or the maintainer already published a new version. Um, please make sure to update that. So that's a flag that, that should be raised. So there is some of some sort of automation and correlation of data, but it's, uh, it's definitely best practice and definitely a tool that it's um, 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 really much needed, especially if you're having hundreds and thousands of uh, workloads. Um, and let me pick one more here. Um, host OS file system tampering. We talked a little bit about file system, and this is important, I would say, across hosts, across uh, containers, and even serverless functions. So uh, insecure container configs can expose uh, uh, the host volumes to greater risk of a uh, file tampering. So if a container is allowed to mount sensitive directories on the host OS, that container can then change files in these, in these directories. And the changes could impact the stability, security of the host and, and all other containers that run on it. So we need to ensure that containers are run with minimal set of file system permissions uh, that are required. Uh, very rarely should container mount local file systems on a host. I mentioned a little bit about that when I talked about anomalous behavior. Uh, any file changes that containers need to persist the disk should be made within the storage volume that is specifically allocated for that purpose for that container. And in no case should containers be able to mount sensitive directories on a host file system, especially those that contain config settings for the uh, operating system. So use tools that can monitor what directories are being mounted by containers and prevent the deployment of containers that will violate these policies. I think many of these countermeasures you could start implementing tomorrow. The questions I think you need to ask yourself is how to do this efficiently at speed and at scale, and, and definitely the rate of uh, a change based on your code is being pushed into production. Uh, the second question is what can I automate here to make my life easier? Now, approaching the, the end of, the, of my section here, just a couple more slides, and then we have one more poll. Um, would like to slowly introduce our product um, um, just so that you can rationalize some of these uh, against the demo we'll show later. Um, this is really one, one of the best parts about the product at, when we talk about compute and the runtime protection. I really love this part. So it's about the predictive model, how to add um, automation to provide automated defense. Um, so what we do here is really a, a static analysis. We start off with that. That's a testing methodology that analyzes applications, components, uh, and finds security vulnerabilities that make our applications susceptible to attack. If we add machine learning here for that correlation model input, that will really look at the different aspects from different, look at the application for different uh, uh, angles, the uh, outcome of this is, is a application's predictive model. Now we have another thing that is called the threat intelligence, which is the live stream uh, with uh, different vulnerabilities. Um, uh, we got automated defense if we couple this with, uh, with the model. Uh, so a predictive model effectively builds applications DNA, if you will, and to prevent malware in time, even without a security policy, you would still be able to detect anomalous behavior. So I think it's a powerful combination of, of tools and processes that are put together to provide this visibility and real-time protection. 
Um, and at the end of the day, it's doing so by discovering that anomalous behavior based on the DNA model uh, and performing certain uh, correlation and comparison techniques. Uh, just before we go into a poll, I'd like to tie this into, into a, a story and then hand over to Mohit to talk about web application and API security a little bit more. So what we have on this slide is um, a combination of, of agent and agentless workload protection. Um, agentless workload security is, uh, is something we provide. We're the first in the market to provide a choice of agentless and, uh, and um, uh, agent or defender workload security. Agentless is really needed, in my opinion, for that quick posture overview that I'm seeing many people use that as an input to their overall application security strategy across your clouds, across your accounts, across your environment and workloads. Uh, some things will have to stay uh, agentless for various reasons. I'm saying sometimes um, people say, hey, I'm not allowed to put anything on my environment. Um, or maybe it's an uphill battle. So maybe that's something we need to, we need to deal with. Um, uh, talk to DevOps folks, uh, see what other agents you may be running there, Dynatrace, Datadog, maybe something else uh, to see what makes sense. If that workload really requires defense in depth, sometimes it could be a third party that would own your operations um, and so on. So this is ideal for that uh, quick and easy visibility, uh, perfect for distributed environments. Uh, and I think it's a great first step to, to secure a cloud cloud environments overall. So how it works, effectively there's a snapshot created on a customer environment, uh, very low cost from a compute storage perspective, data stays with the customer. You can configure um, frequency of scans on demand, periodic scans and so on. Uh, you get a, a very neat report, uh, integration into ticketing systems. Um, hey, this needs to go to devs, this needs to go to SecOps, this is for the infrastructure team so you can manage the remediation of the vulnerabilities discovered uh, and that you get with that report that we furnish you with. Um, how Defender Workload Security, it's an active prevention of exploits. So the best way to think about this and, and just to level set, it's for defense in depth. It's something that, that runs together with your, with your application at your workload level, uh, and it's therefore effect effectively defending cloud environments and providing uh, um, prevention in real time by doing a runtime scanning and anomalous behavioral alerting and so on. And our agents are effectively deployed on the application infrastructure. Our, our agents power our um, web application and API uh, security. We mentioned this a little bit. Uh, we got two deployment models, uh, lots of value add. So Mohit will unpack this. Uh, I'm going to go to the next poll here. Um, so we talked a little bit about different types of Alerting. So would you prefer alert only based security or some sort of auto prevention um, capability? So it's really a subtle here, um, uh, the way we put it. And let me see what happens here. All right, so definitely more prevent block. Um, proactively type of scenarios. This is great. Thanks so much for responding. Hey, Mohit, I'm going to turn over to you to drive the slides and talk awesome. a little bit more about uh, web application and API security. Yeah. Thank you, Vaughn. And Thank you for taking us through all the uh, code build, run and deploy phases of the application lifecycle. The cool thing is that Prisma Cloud can do all of these, but today we're only focusing on uh, application level threats at runtime only. And we do provide the ability to do both alerting, preventing and blocking <laughs> all real time. So <laughs> one thing I really wanna focus on at runtime is web-based threats. I wanna, really you know iter iterate on the point that web applications are the most commonly exploited applications by attackers and what i mean by this is that attackers are leveraging web-based attacks to target applications as their first entry point into the application to access the databases to access various other applications to move laterally and so on and then on top of this 
the number of attacks concerning APIs is growing by like 600% because we know that as developers and application security teams move to a microservices and API based architecture, attackers are also leveraging APIs to then abuse permissions as well as access controls to gain access to critical data behind the applications. And this is very concerning to customers from what we hear. And in the past, you know, WAFs were good enough, but when it comes to microservices architecture, WAFs no longer cut it. So what we came out with is we came out with a web application and API security as we call WAS. And the neat thing is that we integrate our web app and API security within our Prisma Cloud product. So we give you a WAF out of the box to give you protection for your OWASP top 10, things like broken access control, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and more. And then on top of that, we layer in API security so that you get the best of both worlds. So you can, you know, not only gain visibility to all the APIs that are being leveraged within your architecture, but then you can actually go ahead and, you know, alert, ban, and prevent some communications based off of your appetite for risk. And then on top of that, we give you bot risk management to understand the good bots, the known bots, the bad bots, and prevent some of them, as well as unknown bots. And on top of that, we also provide customers with denial of service protection. And we do that by rate limiting number of connections within the application. And then we give you advanced analytics to understand the traffic that is flowing from layer seven to your application and help you profile risk as well as stop that. And the really cool thing is that we have an awesome threat research team here at Pulse Networks called Unit 42. And when they find a vulnerability like Log4j or something that is zero day, we put out zero day virtual patches and custom rules so that the customer can then go ahead and you know leverage the virtual patch to protect their applications from zero day threats. And all of these capabilities that Yvonne and I'm talking about are available through a single UI, which we'll you know gladly demo later in the conversation or later in the call as well. And you know, one thing that customers always ask me is like, Mohit, like there's plenty of WAF providers on the market. Like what what separates your WAF solution than other WAFs and API security solutions? So the cool thing is that we take a holistic approach to application security and we don't just look at it from one angle or one viewpoint. And like Yvonne showed, we look at application security from the time you're coding the application to time you're, you know, building it, deploying it into production, as well as when it's running live in production. And we give you a holistic approach into application security. We help you correlate risk across the application lifecycle. And the cool thing with WAS is although it's focused more on runtime to protect your web apps or APIs running on containers, virtual machines or serverless functions, we are able to also look at API connections between your north south communication as well as your east west communications as well because we are so close to the actual workload and we are so close to the application that we can scale up and scale down with ease as the application does and we have a multitude of deployment options whether it's on a public cloud private cloud hybrid cloud whatever cloud you're using we can cover and we provide both agent-based and agentless deployment options as well so that customers have the flexibility to leverage our solution however they feel comfortable for their security environment and with that that takes me to my next slide so this is just harping on the fact that, you know, we do offer protection for applications on various clouds. We make it very simple and easy to scale with your application because we don't want anything to break as your application scales up or down. And the cool thing, like I want to iterate one more time is because we integrate into a cloud native application protection platform, we provide a holistic approach for application security from code to cloud and your workloads, whether you're on a container, virtual machine, service function, you pick it, we'll give you insights into it. And with that, um, let me hand it over to Vaughn to share a screen to give you how you guys can, to show you how you guys can 
start onboarding Prisma Cloud within minutes and start leveraging the majority of the functionality we just talked about within a few minutes. Yvonne, do you want to take it over? Yes. Thanks, Mohit. Does my screen come up? Uh, yeah, I can see it. All right. All right, great. So yeah, just a few things I'd like to hit on here um, and then hand back over to Mohit for the rest of the demo. Um, this is a landing page. Once you log into Prisma Cloud, it shows uh, the alerts overview effectively. There's also a dashboard and so on. I just wanted to leave it here uh, so we can have a sense of our UI look and feel. So we have alerts coverage, uh, alerts sorted by severity. We can filter uh, this information. Um, what I would like quickly to show is just from an unboxing perspective, how quickly it is to um, add cloud accounts. We support five major CSPs. We'll click on one of them, AWS here, set up your account, choose two different modes. One is read-only mode, the other one is protection mode. This is specifically for a global cloud account onboarding into Prisma Cloud that enables our um, cloud security posture management. So think about it as a visibility, compliance, governance uh, across your cloud. And then when we go into compute, you can pull into pull these accounts into uh, your, your workload from a agentless scanning perspective, um, as well as deploying defenders on the workloads where you need runtime protection. Um, another thing I wanted to show here is, is when we load repositories, Here's a list of things we support from a code repository's perspective. You can load your GitHub uh, for scanning, the integration with your, with your works, workflows, Jenkins, and so on, and then IDs that we support right now. We, it was a continuous um, development here. We have a great vision for our cloud code security. Uh, lots of good stuff are coming out from, from that, um, that development. The thing I'd like to um, talk a little bit based on some of the stuff uh, I discussed during the presentation time uh, will be the vulnerabilities here under compute and monitoring. I want to talk a little bit about the registry scanning. So here we have four uh, registries here found by Prisma Cloud, um, and then a list of all the applications that are using uh, these images to, um, to go to production. Uh, and remember, we want to go as upstream as possible to apply security early on uh, with the shift left style. Here we're looking at, uh, I'll just pick this one first one. We're looking at vulnerabilities and compliance is what I would like to call out uh, among all these other things, the details uh, around uh, our registry, the operating system distro that is running uh, and so on. So the two things I'd like to call out, one of them is under the compliance. If we expand here, we have a high severity um, for this image, um, looks like it's been created as root. So it's a best practice to create images and run containers as non-root user to avoid any permission issues. Uh, this is what I discussed during the um, one of the last slides when we talked about um, our best practices here. Uh, the other thing I'd like to call out and how Prisma Cloud neatly um, visualizes this for us. So these are all the different types of risks particular to this registry. And we have a number of critical. And I want to call out this Zlib here. So if you click on it, we can see that severity is critical. That's the package. Uh, so there's already a CV here. So if we click on this, we'll go on the NIST database that give us a little bit more information. We see that the status, or the, the fixed status um, uh, here means it's already existing. So we have um, uh, this uh, uh, release two for the same version of the, of the distribution of this uh, library. Uh, so about a month ago, a month ago, I remember this in early August that popped up. Uh, and then some of the more verbiage here that we pull from NIST. Uh, this is the thing I wanted to show. Uh, it's very quickly here to, to show the details. Uh, it's a um, um, critical severity, low complexity. This is a dangerous combination and a low hanging fruit for attackers. Uh, we also can see that what's the, the attack vector is through the network. And then there is a fix, which means we got to do something about it. Now, there's another thing as I was reading here, and the reason why I'm popping it up, it's a buffer overflow. Um, so let's let's just double click on this. Um, Zlib is a popular data compression library. It's written in C. It has a direct memory access. Um, as an ex C, C++ engineer, I loved it for that. There are not really guardrails. guardrails. It let me do what I need to do. But if not written carefully, 
uh, we can introduce a bug easily. And this is a big bug that has a huge impact from a cybersecurity perspective, hence the call out. So it says here, here buffer overflow. Buffer is a memory block used for temporary storage as in during our program execution. So say we have an eight byte memory block as per the program variable, and there's a 20 byte input that comes in. What can happen? Pretty much anything. And it depends on a couple of things. What the program will do is write past the allocated block and potentially rewrite over a second memory block that maybe was needed for a program execution. What will happen here is that it will effectively change the execution path of our program. It can crash, uh, it can expose data or, or access to our host. The other thing that can happen depends on what was packed in those extra 12 bytes uh, that was now written. So perhaps a malicious code um, effectively is on our side of the fence. It runs in our memory and it can it, it's being executed. So this scenario is a is a can lead to a loss of sensitive data access to our system, and uh, this is how zero day is exploited to gain access. So this is really what I wanted to call out uh, from a, a registry image scanning and the way we we look at these these vulnerabilities. And Prisma Cloud lets us um, remediate this as fast as possible. So this is the only couple of things I wanted to show here. Um, that it's more pertinent to, to build and deploy uh, stage. I will turn it over to Mohit now to show a little bit more about um, WAS. Thank you, Vaughn. Let me uh, share my screen. And... All right. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yes. Thank you. So, yeah, Vaughn just showed you how simple it was to onboard your accounts and your applications and workloads and then dive right into the vulnerabilities and why they're concerning. And I wanted to show you that, you know, we can, we can cover your applications and workloads. Like I said, whether they're on a public, private or a hybrid cloud, we can attach onto your hosts, containers and serverless functions. But right now I'm just going to focus on the containers. And I have an application called sock shop that is deployed, which is just a front end website that where we sell socks. And there's various parts of this application, like the front end, the database, the cart systems, the payment systems, the ordering systems, and so on. But let's dive in a little bit deeper. As you can see, I can see all the various components of the application and the workload that they're running on and the connections between the applications as well. And if I double click on the queue portion, I can look in get a single pane of glass for all the vulnerabilities, all the compliance risks, any runtime anomalies or events that happened, and any web application or API security risks for this application. And if I were to double click, all the vulnerabilities are prioritized based off their severity, just like Yvonne showed. We give you the severity and we tell you why this is a vulnerability, what package it is in, and what the CVE is, and when it was fixed as well as why this is a risk and the cool thing is that the risk factor shows you why this is a critical severity on top of this we give you all the compliance information as well as any runtime threats that are related to the application and then the cool thing is we when we show you a vulnerability we're able to double click and show you what layer of the package this vulnerability exists in. so then you can go and fix it as early as possible so let's dive a little bit deeper into runtime threats specifically. Now, as Yvonne mentioned, our runtime threats are anomaly based or are powered by anomaly based machine learning that profile the behavior of your application and workload. And when anomalous behavior does go on, we're able to understand and shut down that, shut down that process. So we can look at all the events from the time that this container was started to querying to ports opened on this container, to the time that we started profiling network activity as well as processes, and then to the time that we saw a runtime threat and the action that we're able to take. Now, a lot of you folks mentioned that, you know, you guys want specific granularity when it comes to protecting your application. And the cool thing is that when we, when we give you the ability to add rules, we give you the ability to turn on rules as well as alert and block based off of your appetite for risk for runtime threats. 
And the same thing applies to our web application and API security. If I go over to my WASP capabilities, and let's say I have an application running on a container, and I've profiled the container and I've profiled what I want to protect. From there, it's very simple to add rules and start alerting, blocking, or preventing miss, well, preventing bad traffic from coming in. And from here, there's an application on the sock shop. I've written a test rule to then go ahead and look at the traffic. I've entered the ports that the application is listening, working on. And from there, I can then start protecting it against the OWASP top 10. I can, you know, disable rules, alert, prevent against SQL injection, cross-site scripting, OS command injection, and more. And if I if I disable them, I don't get anything. If I alert it, I get an alert notification for me to then go and take action. If I prevent, I can then go ahead and stop that request from going through. And if I ban, I could pretty much put that user in a penalty box so that they're unable to make any requests to the application as well. And the cool thing is that we provide this for your web apps as well as APIs. And then on top of this, we're able to provide DOS protection. It's as simple as turn it on with a click, enter in the burst rate limit for how many requests you'd like to take in per second and the average rate. And if you want to add a match condition for granular detail, you can. And we also provide access control to give you IP-based or geo-based access to who should be accessing your application by inbound from inbound traffic. And then on top of that, we layer in bot protection for known bots, unknown bots, bots that you might define, as well as malicious bots that you want to disable alert or prevent traffic on. And the cool thing is that we do provide custom rules but we also provide virtual patches. So this is for that zero day threats where you have zero day threats. Our threat research team provides virtual patches. And these are custom rules that you can then enforce on your applications based off of CVEs. Like we gave a custom, a custom patch for spring shell when it first came out. We even gave a custom patch for log for shell on the day of when that vulnerability was first published. And it's as simple as taking this virtual patch and then applying it to where you see your applications that are at risk. All right, so I know that was a lot to take in, but if I were to sum this up, if I were to sum the demo up in a few sentences, it's very easy and simple to onboard your cloud accounts. But once you're onboarded, you can then protect a variety of workloads and applications, and you can protect it across the application lifecycle from the time you're building it, looking at vulnerabilities and compliance to the time the application is running in production, all the things from runtime threats, as well as an added layer of protection for your web apps and APIs against malicious web-based attacks. Now with that, I'm going to stop sharing and go back to the presentation to and give it back to Yvonne to recap some of the uh, lessons learned. Thanks, Mohit. Great demo. Um, yeah, we have a summary slide, just some takeaways here. Um, what we discussed is that how organizations effectively build, deploy, run apps in the cloud has become complex. Um, we're in an agile world. Um, scale, speed is what we have to deal with. So we need a security vendor and security tools and processes that effectively provide a single unified view into your entire ecosystem to ensure they're protected. It covers all of those code, build, deploy, run stages of your applications. Um, you need something that's frictionless. You need to um, look into the blind spots and, and so on. So just a few things to call out. Um, it's ineffective to rely on legacy security solutions to protect your digital assets because they're not designed for that. Uh, they can provide uh, deep actionable insights into your heterogeneous environment, which you need. Um, hybrid environments continue to prevail. Uh, require, that requires a runtime protection solution that can protect your workloads in and off the cloud in real time. Um, use modern agent-based and hybrid models. Um, so agentless scanning together with agent-based for both cloud-native workloads and workloads designed for on-prem data center environments. Um, so I think you need a proactive, comprehensive approach there. 
uh, and with just the specific investment in technology, people, processes. Um, and there's a question here, and since I'm mentioning this, I read a question um, from Rob, what is the biggest mistake organizations make when it comes to moving uh, when it comes to moving work close to a public cloud? I would say they don't really think about security in the long term. They don't they they uh, deploy things in, in in very fast manner. I know people who just get their cloud invoice in the end of the month, but they have no idea what is running there and and what's the rate of uh, of new things that are popping up. So that so just thinking about security in the long term and effectively having. Uh, of people who, who are chartered with protecting your asset. I think it's important. Um, another thing I would mention here is uh, I, I would say even be, behind, you know, without the, forget about technology for a moment. I think what we struggle with today when we implement, when we want to implement a holistic best practice uh, across all your aspects is the lack of collaboration between teams. So you need a partnership between the teams with a solution that will provide you on off cloud application security, a different role based access model. Uh, and to remove friction from the process that you have currently. I would say that's a number one challenge. Uh, Silas yeah, would be one add, of the culprit. I was going to say, Yvonne, to add yeah. that, you need a solution that integrates into your development workflows, like how you showed in the demo, a tool that can integrate with your repositories, with your development right. tools, with IntelliJ or VS Code. Or exactly, GitHub, exactly. GitLab. And this effectively would, would provide a value for all of the stakeholders. So you can have all the tools in the world, but if that tool does not provide value in a frictionless, non-intrusive manner to all of the stakeholders, I think it will be very, very difficult to implement the cloud security successfully in general. Um, we talked a little bit about a protection continuum. So complementary to firewalls, firewalls for network level protection, you need cloud security posture management, cloud workload protection, more around application level security, web application, API. It's just attack surfaces is, is pretty uh, wide right now. Um, um, so let me see. Yeah, if I wanted to bring something more up, Mohit, please, please jump in here. I'm also looking at the questions uh, that came um, from Lisa. How do I protect my containers under Docker and my Linux servers? Um, please look at our on-demand material uh, called Top 5 Container Risk top five container risks where we go through containers through um, um, their three stages of deployment plus architecture and environment. So overall five areas and we go deep dive into different uh, uh, risks. Uh, this is something that I presented with our PM Oxa Taylor. So if you look at that, you'll see some of the some of the sections of today's slides in, in that uh, one hour, but it goes into much more details uh, around um, protecting containers under Docker. And then the last slide I'd like to call out here, uh, to learn more about Prisma Cloud, here's a link. Uh, no strings attached, free trial, so that you can hook it up to your system um, and see realize value for yourself. Uh, and just a, a bragging slide, we're the leader in the Forrester Wave Cloud <laughs> Workload Protect Security that spans a little bit more than the, than the CWP in general that we discussed today. Um, SC Awards recognized us as the best cloud workload protection solution. Uh, ranked number one uh, across two uh, areas in, in peer spot for CWP and WAF, and the leader in the Gigant Raider for vulnerability management. Yvonne, I would say don't don't take our word for it. Go try out the product and see how simple and easy it is to use to get the value to understand the value for yourself. Thank you very much for the time today. Yeah, no, great presentation, guys. Um, and uh, it, it does look like we're running out of time, but you know there were a lot of great questions that came in. Um, Mohit, I know you were looking through some of those. Are, are there any more that you guys want to tackle now, or do you want to just grab them all um, post-event? Uh, just to get back to so, so the uh, the last question from Ned: Could the Prisma Cloud uh, be included as part of the liability protection clause for cyber insurance? I'm not the best person for that, Mohit. I don't know if you know. I, I sent the question to somebody, Ned. If there's a way that you could um, connect with me uh, separately, I'd like to follow up on this. I would also like to understand uh, if if this is something that would work in that case. Um, yeah, and, and maybe we can question drop from our. Ned. Hmm? I was like, maybe we can drop our emails in the in the chat so that they can um, email us questions because I know we're running out of time. Yeah, yeah. 
I can do that, Mohit, while, while you um, maybe take the next question. Does Prisma Cloud WAS manages all aspects and upper layers of the OC model and the TCP IP model? Some uh, aspects, yes. Not not everything, um, especially yeah, not around TCP IP. Yeah, I was going to say the same, same thing. It's not really around the TCP model. It's more around just layer 7, HTTP, and HTTPS requests uh, for requests that are encrypted um, customers do need to provide a certificate so that you know we can then go ahead decrypt those decrypt those requests and inspect the traffic more along those lines thanks mohit um scott i don't know if there's a way for us to share our emails so that um, ned and whoever would like to follow up yeah, no, we'll we'll get you uh, their questions so you can you can respond uh, to them directly um, as well. Oh, okay, we'll get their emails. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Scott. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, um, so this has been great. Uh, and just you know, is is one last question? You know, just if if somebody wants to get started uh, with with Prisma Cloud, um, any any sort of last recommendations here? The recommendation is check out the uh, hands-on trial. If not, reach out to us. Uh, we'll get you set up with one of our with one of our internal folks to give you a custom demo and a walkthrough, and we'll try to make sure that your needs are accommodated. All right, super. We'll leave that uh, that link up there just for uh, another couple of seconds uh, down in the lower right corner. That's uh, that's a live link. Um, that you can click on if, if you would be interested in getting one of those hands-on trials. Well, Ivan, Mohit, uh, this has been great. Uh, really appreciate your time today. Thanks for uh, bringing us up to speed on, on Palo Alto. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, everybody. Everyone. And with that, on uh, before we wrap up, we do have one more piece of business. It's the three hundred dollar Amazon gift card prize drawing, and the winner today is Brenda Kebert from Kansas. So, congratulations to Brenda. We'll be in touch to get you your card. Um, and on behalf of the actual tech media team, I want to thank Palo Alto for making this event possible, and thanks as always for attending and for your great questions. That's going to conclude today's event. Have a great rest of your day.